it's like, oh, oh my God, Chandler, oh, so cool. Yes. Oh, Carrie Joe, oh, you know what I mean? And I think as an ambassador of the kingdom, I'm going to take the approach of like letting people know like, hey, I am not the Lord God Almighty. I am Dante Bo and I fart. The Profile with Premier Christianity Magazine. Hello and welcome to The Profile here on Premier Christian Radio. I'm Emma Fowl. The Profile is a show where we sit down with a well-known Christian to hear more about their life, their faith and their ministry. It is brought to you in association with Premier Christianity, the UK's leading Christian magazine. The monthly title features more interviews just like this one, as well as all of the latest news, reviews, columnists and much, much more. Plus, there's great new digital content uploaded daily to our website, premierchristianity.com. To get full access wherever you are in the world, there are print and digital subscription options available. Get the magazine delivered directly to your door or access all of the latest content via your computer, smartphone or the Premier Christianity app. Just head over to premierchristianity.com forward slash subscribe for all of the information. On today's show, I'm speaking to Dante Bao. If you're not familiar with the name, you may well have heard the singer's distinctive gravelly vocals on worship songs such as Bethel Music's Champion or Maverick City's Old Church Basement. But alongside being part of two of the best known worship collectives around, Dante is also a successful solo artist and enjoys a career as a model. Now, you may not find many worship leaders' chest measurements and shoe sizes on the homepage of their website, but when I asked whether he felt any conflict between his faith and his role as a Christian artist and worship leader and that of the world of high-end fashion, his thoughtful reply was challenging and well thought through. He was refreshingly honest about the pain of his past, how he survived a childhood overshadowed by drugs and sexual abuse, and the influence that this has had on his music. Dante was nominated for five awards at this year's Grammys, eventually taking home the award for Best Contemporary Christian Music Album for Old Church Basement. In today's Profile interview, we talk about stereotyping in the music industry, overcoming adversity, and why he's horrified at the idea of being famous for being a Christian. Let's listen now. Are you only 29 years of age? Are you, are you 30 yet? No, you know, it's like Google said I'm 29 years old and I was born in 1992, but really I am 28 years old and I was born in 1993. You're even younger. That's it. That's even, even more interesting. Younger. You've, you've achieved a lot <laughs> in your short life. So you're, you're not even 30. You're part of two of the biggest Christian worship collaboratives on the planet. You, you're currently waiting on five Grammy nominations, is it? For, that's in a couple yeah. of weeks time. That must be very exciting. Yeah, two. We have two weeks until we find out. I'm so excited. Yeah. Oh my goodness! So that's that's a that's a lot. You're already incredibly successful as a 28 year old worship leader. Oh. How did it all start for you? Tell us about what your life was like growing up. I was raised in the country, so it was um, very modest. And my grandparents, you know, they had like a farm and. So chickens and goats and like all that stuff. And that was how I was raised and brought up in church because my grandparents on both sides were Christian. My parents, um, they were prior to me being born, but then like um, not when I was born. So I wasn't raised in and of itself in a Christian home. However, my parents allowed me to go to church. My grandma, they actually encouraged me and my brother to be in church and raised us as Christians, even though they weren't really like doing that, you know, and so, yeah, I, I, I think music was like my first love because when I went to church, that was like the more entertaining part of church, I guess, like, because I mean, being so young, you don't really understand everything the pastor's even talking about, you know what I mean? It's like so above your head and above where you just are as a human being. So, but the music is like relatable to everybody. It's melody, it's words, you know, so it's like something that I kind of gravitated towards and, and um, and just felt compelled to kind of like do. And funny story, I never told anybody this. This is so funny. One time in church, I had a solo and I was really excited about it. It was my first solo on the choir. And then the better singer, she's an older woman, like not older, but she was like in her 20s. She was a better singer. I was like only like eight or something. 
she took my song. I was very disappointed about that. Anyway, but <laughs> but but I remember just crying about it and being so passionate about it. And that's when I kind of I think for the first time, it's the first time I'm ever saying this, but that was the first time I think I felt like, oh, I really, I really like singing to people. And that, you know, if I ever don't like if I don't have that chance, sometimes I just feel bummed out, you know. So anyway, that's where it started. <laughs> So all through, you know, growing up high school, it was always like, I'm going to be a musician. I want to be a singer. That was that was always your only aim. Oh, no, 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 no. Yeah. Like I loved music as a, from an early age. However, I used to fake sing in church. I don't know. Some level of comfort was there for me. Just not actually giving it my all. And mm. kind of like I'll do this little stupid like. I did this funny thing with my boys where I just wouldn't use any vibrato or anything serious. And I was a kid. I was so embarrassed that I could sing. Because in the South, it wasn't something that anybody ever thought you could make it from or, you know, it's like considered a joke or not even like a real, like a real aspiration. It wasn't. So um, I love baseball. I played baseball all through school. And when I was younger, like um, I'd play like basketball. And that's something I really enjoyed, you know, but music came a little later, like, more in my teens where I felt like, oh, I really want to do this. But um, I revealed to my grandmother when I was like 12 or 13, I could really sing and I sang for her. And she called around to all the family members and had me sing to everybody, my aunts and my uncles, my cousins. And so that's when it, I think, became more official. <laughs> and when, when was the first time you realized, oh, I could actually do this for real, for a job? You know, it's crazy. Secretly, I always felt like I could. Mm. secretly I think not knowing what to do with that or even knowing if that's even like legit or not because it's my own perception and my own opinion of how I sound and at that point I had never even revealed to other people that I could sing so um I feel like secretly I always thought I could I think when I became really comfortable in like my teenage years I knew I could like I felt like you know I had a good sense of judgment as far as like past the spirituality of everything, just the practical um, application of music and stuff like that. So I just felt like I had a gift, you know. Did you have, was it pastors or leaders in the church or was there anyone in particular that really in encouraged you and pushed you towards it? Yeah, my family, you know, my mom and my dad are the biggest supporters. I think they're the best parents ever, like no joke. I would want them to raise America. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> but um yeah, my parents were pretty adamant about me, like, chasing my dreams just because they heard me say it. And so I was in the studio all the time and, like, writing songs for them and, like, coming to live. I remember, like, going into the, going in the living room and I'm like, I have a song. And, like, just not being embarrassed because my parents really believed me. Then also my grandparents who would, they would put me on this, you know what a center block is? And they would, um, I would stand on that. My grandfather would stand me on that, my grandmother, and they would sit in front of me and I'll perform for them. And so that was pretty much my life. Maverick City as a thing has been on the scene now for probably five, six years. No, I think we, we started maybe 2018. You were part of the actual setup and the birth of that, weren't you? Yeah, I was a part of the first text message. It was, it was me and a guy named Kier and two of our founders. And Kiara was like, I have a friend that lives close by. His name's Brandon Lake. Can he come as well? No, we didn't know who Brandon Lake was. And uh, we were like, sure, yeah, bring Brandon Lake. That's fine. You know what I mean? <laughs> but the thing is, me and Brandon actually roommate. Like, we, we actually um, stayed in the same hotel room. We had never met each other before. And then we instantly became friends, you know, obviously that day. But, um, yeah, I was part of the, the first ever text message to start something we didn't have a name we just wanted to write songs yeah and it's a it has pretty much become one of the biggest worship collectives in the world now especially mm -hmm. within the younger generation I think there's something about it that has captured the younger Christian worshippers heart what is it that makes Maverick City different or special yeah I think we're real people we come from a real place and I think there was such a void of like brown people in mainstream worship, obviously. That's not like a secret, <laughs> but uh, it was just a void. And I think, you know, our upbringing, which is more urban, more Southern gospel, like, like more black gospel music, that all, I 
think brings a new sound or a new vibe to what, what we would call contemporary Christian music. You know what I mean? And I think a lot of the young kids find themselves in it. You know what I mean? Whether it be how we dress or whether it be our demeanor or, you know, whatever the case may be, I think our personal, our, our personalities and all that stuff matters. I think, um, I think people are finding themselves in it, especially a lot of young kids who look up to, you know, Nicki Minaj and look up to Cardi, all these people. I think, you know, we're like that breath of fresh air for them. It's like, okay, like, you know, you can look cool and still be a worshiper or whatever the case may be. You know, I think like that's very appealing. That's the top of my head. <laughs> no, I, I think it, I think it's a really good point. You're, you, you're completely right, aren't you? Up until Maverick, like, you know, you look at all of the big worship collectives, all of the main Christian worship leaders, they're all very white. You've definitely never seen an entirely like brown mm. collective. I yeah. Mean, not collective, entirely, you know what I mean? So I find it interesting and fun, obviously, to be a part of something that's like trailblazing and making like, because I'm sure in the future there'll be so many, right? And that's interesting that you've you've touched there as well on the importance of image. So when I first went onto your website, I'm like, oh, but I've never been onto a worship leader's website where the first thing I've seen are his chest measurements and his shoe size. And then I was looking at your Instagram and I'm like, oh, he's a model. I didn't realize this about you. So this is this a side hustle or is this just another part of Dante's life? Tell us about it. Honestly, it's just another part of my life. I did um, a model, I did Tommy Hilfiger like this year, which is very exciting and like Vogue. And I, I think it's just something I find it's an outlet for me it's an outlet like I think I can you know express myself in a different way which is through fabric and like colors and just you know shapes and clothing and stuff like that so I love it I enjoy it I enjoy it I'm six feet tall so I'm like I want to model here and there and like also do my music and I feel like we're you know there's no Christians in that industry so void there's a few obviously but like it's so void of who for, of us, I guess, because we stay away from it. I don't know why. But um, I think, like, me being a part of that organization, like, just fashion is, like, going to also change, you know, kingdom and what how we perceive even that stuff. Because I know sometimes it can look, be looked down upon, you know, yeah. or be looked at as like, more shameful or, like, um, more just, you know, I don't know. Like, I get it, like, bang, kind of, in a way. Mm. yeah and so you've obviously thought about that as a as a worship leader what would you say to those people yeah. who would levy that criticism and say this is about vanity it is about money it's materialism christians shouldn't be involved. yeah you know it's like nothing's about money right it's like for me you, you make money because you believed in it before you made money no one is just making money like first of all and i think that's one of the misconceptions when it comes to being an artist, being a fashion designer, whatever the case may be, I think before we made money, we were doing it. And that's why we make money. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and so I think I think for me, it's it's just learning to um, accept who we are as Christians. And God made us little creators. You know, he's he's a he's the creator of everything. And I think sometimes we limit ourselves in our creativity thinking that Jesus is just this like black and white straight faced God who's sitting on tower, like judging everything, being mean, you know? And really, man, he's the ultimate creator. He said, let there be light and there was. Like, wow, what about that? You know what I mean? And I think there's more to us than preaching and singing worship songs. I think worship is obedience. You know, um, Abraham went up and he was gonna, you know, sacrifice his son for, for God. And obviously he was obedient, but that's the first time worship was used in the scriptures when Abraham was, when a father was going to sacrifice his son because he felt like that's, that's what the Lord told him to do. And um, in the scripture, he said, they asked him, where is he going? It's like me and the boy would go up to worship, but really he was going to sacrifice his son, which the angel came and interjected and didn't have to do it. But obedience is better than sacrifice. So I rather do what I feel like the Lord has put in me than to sacrifice the blessing and the favor and the calling and all that stuff because of what other people think, you know what I mean? And I, I would tell any young guy, young girl listening to me, like you, 
hear the voice of God, the tangible voice of God, you know, man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out the mouth of God. And that's talking about the rhema word. That's talking about his actual voice, not so much the scripture, which we do live by, but like that scripture specifically is speaking about his voice. And I think I would just more tell people to listen to his voice because people will leave comments and people will tell you what you need to do and they'll give you a vision, you know, they'll give you a vision. And so I feel confident in it if that answers the question. I think it's the Lord and I think um, we're taking up ground. And yeah, that's all. I think some people make it deeper than what it needs to be. I think they're like, oh, he's going to leave Christian music or it's getting too, too mainstream. And I'm like, Jesus was the most mainstream person I know. You know, he, I mean, his, he got the best, number one best selling book right now. You know, he's like, he's been. You're quite right for young, especially for the younger generation, for for Christians that are growing up in in the world and, and looking to models and pop stars for their inspiration, it's really important actually that they can find that those models within the church as well, the people that they can relate yeah. to. That, you know, not that we we become so worldly that we're just giving them an easy option, but the 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 fact of the matter is, like you say, young people do need people they can look up to, and um, in those worlds where it is more difficult to become a Christian, that wouldn't just be fashion, music, and a lot of the arts, actually, TV, films, etc. It's important that we have Christian representation. Yeah, yeah. Even, like, living life as a Christian is hard. Forget, mm-hmm. like, being in an industry. When you wake up in the morning and you're a wife and you have children and you have sisters and you have a mom and a dad who you're trying to be a good daughter, a good son, a good husband, a good wife, a good, uh, you know, all these different things. And you're also trying to live a life that's pleasing to God without getting road rage, without getting mad at your boss, without having a fit, you know, over something you shouldn't have a fit over. Like, it's like without being lustful and jealous and envious and like all those things. I feel like some people think when you get like success, it's like you change, but yeah, you do change, but you know what I mean? Like, I think they think you're like, morals go down and re- like because you have a lot more now you don't need people to tell you what to do you're you're more just loose with it but really I mean I've been in Walmart where the lady checking me out is arrogant and rude you know I've I've been at you know fast food joints where you know I'm like shut the bed dude like whoa you know what I mean? like, and so I think I think everyday life is just you know um it's a sacrifice to give your life to God. It's an everyday yes. Like I wrote something on Instagram not too long ago and I said, uh, I say yes again today. It's like reciting my vows every day. Like I choose you today again because yesterday doesn't count. You know, it's a new day and I have new trials, new, you know, things that are going to pop up and um, it's an everyday, it's an everyday yes. You know what I mean? So I think being a model and also not being a model, just being a husband, it's very hard. So tell us a little bit about Joyful. That's uh, your the song that came out that you said you wrote during lockdown. And um, I think I, I saw you say in another interview that um, some people have said it was a bit incongruous that you wrote a song called Joyful during lockdown after the race riots. You know, arguably we've had a, a pretty tough couple of years on the planet Earth. Was that a prophetic message? Were you, was it just something that came out? You're like, we need to make more of an effort to be this type of people now? You know, it's like, I guess it was both and, you know, it is prophetic in nature just because of this season and the era we were in, you know, it wasn't the best season to write about joy and when no one probably felt super joyful. But I think also it was more of a reality check and, and saying like, you know, this is not the end. You know what I'm saying? The joy I'm speaking of in Joyful is an eternal joy. It's a joy saying, I know what the battle, I know that Jesus won the battle at the end of it all. Like I've read the book, I know what happens at the very end and I'm excited about that. And that's the joy I have. My joy, joy is different from happiness. Happiness where we're all, happiness is a temporary fix. You know, somebody can buy you a present and feel good, you know what I mean? But you can also walk away from getting that present and go back to reality and feel like, you know, shameful or just feel like, man, what am I doing in my life, all this stuff. But joy is something that, you know, is a choice and it's more eternal than anything. It's just saying like, you know, I, I know where I'll be. I know who I'll be with. And for that reason, 
I have no reason to be down in the dumps. Like if for nothing else that I know God, you know what I mean? I know Jesus. And um, that's the joy I'm speaking about in the actual song. And how was lockdown for you? Um, Obviously not being on the road as a musician must have been pretty tough. Was it? And also I know in America there was a much bigger implication with the race riots as a black man. how, How was that? horrible that's how it was you know it's miserable I feel like I went through a little depression and I started walking around we have like a little track behind our apartments well I used to live in this apartment complex we had like a little track and I would I would actually take walks around that every day once I found myself slipping into a depression and um it was like a mild thing you know just I think we all kind of had that dark cloud over us actually you know what I mean I dare to say we all had that and so I just chose to take these walks and um during that I found peace and tranquility and all that stuff but you know obviously I was angry about the racial tension and things that people were saying in the church that you know are worth saying in the church I think like it, it all just took a toll on me however you know, I've learned through that season specifically because I lost my grandfather also January 2020. So right before the lockdown, I had lost literally my best friend in the world. And that's what I wrote Voice of God about. It's about my grandfather and uh, my album is dedicated to my grandfather. But um, yes, yeah, so it was all a lot for me. However, I, um, what I was going to say is that nothing lasts forever. And so over time, you know, working out with the Lord and praying and hanging out with my friends, really just brought more clarity and 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 honestly created this album circles since the pandemic did it. You know, I had two albums before that that I shelved and I put on the shelf. And so yeah, I just didn't feel like they were relevant. So I really felt like I didn't feel like they were I didn't feel like they were relevant. But I felt like during the pandemic, me writing Circles album, I'm like, this is so profound because it's all happy stuff. But it's a, the name, our name is Circles because it felt like we were just going around and around, like losing our minds, you know? But um, yeah, I think the Lord just wanted me to sing about good stuff. I don't know, yeah. in that bad season. And it just came out that way. And I wasn't always in the best place, but that's what was like coming out of me. And so but yeah, I'm very proud. Of Circles is a, it's an incredibly honest album. And I think that's a good reflection of the pain that we've been through over the last couple of years, isn't it? Because, yeah. you know, I think, I think that is how we deal with a lot of that turmoil is, is processing it. And I guess as a musician, one of those ways you process it is through your art. Exactly. Thanks for that. Did you like that album? I did. I really liked it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I've been listening to it a lot recently. <laughs> It's a upbeat. I love it. The energy is awesome. I, I think, I mean, I don't, I love my music, but like this album, I really, really like enjoy, you know, outside of like creating and stuff like that. Usually artists, after you create something, you're moving on, you know, it's like, this is something that I think still helps me and like gets me through some of the days, you know? So it's a good, yeah. Anyway, I'm glad you like it. <laughs> Do you have one particular genre of music where you feel really comfortable or you, uh, you know, Circles strikes me again as a non-professional music journalist as crossing quite a lot of genres and, and that's sure. what I like about it. But do you have one genre where you do feel happier or are you always just kind of like, I like everything, I get my inspiration from everywhere? I mean, I love r and anything with soul. So that could be so many genres, I guess. But like, um, like singers that sing with soul, which would be like, I was raised in my house. I was raised more like Motown, you know, my mom and dad listens to a lot of like um, Aretha Franklin and like Ray Charles and like all those good singers and stuff like that. And which helped me because I had such a raspy voice. And so like those guys were kind of the guys I listened to. And then obviously when I get in the car, my grandma to go to school or do something wherever she was, she took care of us just as much as our parents. And um, when, I, when I'd be around her, she was listening to gospel music constantly. So I was a fan of gospel and R&B very early. Both, like both of those were more of my primary, like, I guess, go-tos. Hey, this is Sam. Really hope you're enjoying this conversation right here on the Profile Podcast today. Could you do me a favor right now? It will take you just two seconds to give us a rating and a review wherever you found this podcast. Just a couple of seconds to give us a rating is so, so helpful. It helps other people to discover the show as well. So if you could do that, we would so appreciate it. 
And did you ever feel growing up when you were sort of getting into music, were you ever torn between the Christian music world and, and the non-Christian music world? Or were you always like, I'm going to be a worship leader? Or did you always want to be just a musician first? Or how did the worship stroke your solo stuff? How does it all hang together in your head now? Yeah, all of it. You know, I'm a much success. I'm more successful at mainstream music on radio than I am at worship music. You know what I mean? So I, I think all of it, um, I never felt like insecure just because I, I just know who I am, you know? So I, think, I never felt like, oh, I'm not as Christian now because I like um, this or that. You know, I love Lauren Hill. Now I just felt just as Christian and listening to her. Then I, I did listen to Kim Walker, you know? Just whatever, you know, different, different sounds bring about different results. That's true. But um, I definitely feel like um, with my music specifically, the reason why I am the first to be nominated for five Grammys in our genre which is crazy to me, I think it's because I didn't close myself off to being a gospel artist or to being a CCM artist or to being like this urban AC artist. You know, I kind of like um, did it all and um, nominated in all the categories. And so I think I think that was, that's in, in and of itself the fruit of my parents and my grandparents putting everything in that big gumbo pot of music and me singing whatever comes to my heart. You know, so sometimes it's about love and uh, most of the time it's about God. So, yeah. What about your own personal faith? You said your grandparents always took you to church. Are you one of those kids that like, I can't remember a time I didn't believe in Jesus or was there a moment when you committed your life to Jesus? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I've always believed in God, you know, my whole life, honestly. <laughs> it sounds like I'm blind, but I uh, just always believed in Jesus. I always felt like he was close to me. Um, never doubted him as far as his uh, realness probably doubted whether he's going to come through from some stuff or not but I just get mad at God because I believe in him so much even as a kid I believe in God so much when I would lose my shoes or when I would lose something around the house I literally pray and I get angry because I'm like you know where he I talk to God like a human being I'm like, I remember as a kid being like like specifically I literally remember vividly like being like you know where it is I need my shoes I have to go like Help me find my shoes. You know what I mean? I had so much faith, faith in God, even in that, that, you know, just being a kid, you know? And so I had a encounter at 16 years old in my room where I was listening to a fellow worship leader, Kara Sheard's album, where I fell on my face, cried, got filled with the Holy Spirit, woke up the next morning. My mom left me on the floor because she said she felt like she didn't supposed to wake me up. So I, I missed school that day but I was filled with the Holy Spirit and I was healed from being dyslexic. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. And so you were that one was, day that's what I consider went. my moment where I was like, oh, okay. Like, this is like, this is like different. You know, I had an encounter. Never had a personal encounter where I cried or anything. Just always believed in it. <laughs> but that was my first time, like, having an emotional, but like more so like felt very conscious driven too. You know what I mean? In experience with God, you know, in my room. Weirdly enough, I used to play Christian music all the time. I played R&B and Christian music all the time in my room, but I would blast it because I always love music. And my mom, and, my mom would never bother me, like never bother me. But this one time I'm playing that album, I remember it like crazy. I just started weeping. And I, I liked the feeling of it. I felt like almost like I was getting free. It just felt, felt really, really good. So I just leaned into it. And that's, I feel like that's what um, caused me to also do primor primarily Christian music. Because before I was really more R&B and I would do Christian music, you know. But um, that day is when I literally started doing just really more Christian music. Not because I wanted to be more Christian, but because that was what my life became. Mm. So if you're going to sing about your life, like literally every day is surrounded by Jesus. And my friends are Christians, my, <laughs> my staff is Christian. Like my, you know, so it's like, you know, everything was that. And so that's what came out of me, you know what I mean? And is there a little bit of kind of like, that's that's how you first encountered the power of the Holy Spirit for the first time. And, and it made you realize actually worship leaders have this responsibility stroke ability to, to impart that to other people. Yeah, that's cool too that's cool to be someone's soundtrack for their encounter yeah like you could I met you want to be in their room some 16 year old boy listening to Dante and encounter the Holy Spirit yeah amen 
That's an honor, isn't it? That's that's a real <laughs> such thing. an honor. It's a big honor. That's crazy because you changed you, you changed their path. You know what I mean? Like I said, my path was one way, which wasn't a bad way. It's just you know, God had other plans for me, and and I follow I followed him after that encounter. Like I like not just going to church on Sundays. I've really always been very serious about the voice of God like knowing it for myself, not even what a pastor would preach to me. I just wanted to know where I am like with the Lord and, and, and where I'm going and like direction driven very much so when it comes to the Lord and Holy Spirit, like leading me and guiding me and teaching me everything. You know what I mean? I, I always say like it's the best teacher because I don't know, like me and my, my parents taught, raised me one way, which is a great way. But I even as an adult, like adopted such new, so many new things and I don't know I don't know where they came from but it's just the Holy Spirit's really like a great great teacher that that's really interesting because I think a lot of people would say you know I have a 60 year old daughter and, and we were talking the other day she's she's been raised in the church she loves Jesus but she would still say to me I I struggle to hear God's voice mommy I don't know how to hear God and um it's such a big question isn't it and you know people have written books about it so what would your advice be to someone who's like, I don't know if I hear the voice of God for myself? Like how, how, how does the voice of God come to you best? Well, I think a lot of times, you know, it's God by the nature of the conversation. Like, I think sometimes we're like, oh, that God, what does that mean? My good conscience, you know what I mean? And a lot of times it's like, um, for me, I analyze what was just spoken or what I just felt. I'm like, that's the Lord, like, cause it's nature. And I think a lot of it is, you know, with, with age, you understand his nature more, you know, cause you, you read the Bible, you sing, you sing song, you start understanding, oh, this is how he is, his likeness, it's how he sounds, it's how he talks. And so you're like, clearly that wasn't the devil telling me to do something that great, that awesome, like, you know what I mean? Or that for the kingdom, like, I don't have to question about the devil telling me to go on the missions field. Like, some people, sometimes people overcomplicate it, like, is that God telling me to, like, go and, like, save souls in Africa? Yeah, of course, probably was God, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, <laughs> but I think, um, I think, you know, it's very difficult when you're young because, you, you, you know, you don't know how to, like, you know, make it distinct whether it's God or yourself or the devil, you know? But I think for sure, I know my own voice. I, you know, I can be selfish as a human being because human beings naturally have that. Like sometimes we can be selfish with what we want and what. Oh, I don't want to go there. Oh no, I'll do that next week. You know what I mean? Like so, I can tell if it's me and my ego, and I can also just tell. No, that's the nature of God, and I need to move. But I think learning His nature helps. You know, like that's that's Him. You yeah. know. So would you mind talking to me a little bit more about your childhood and you just tell me if, if there's places you don't want to go because I you've spoken really warmly about your parents, but I've also read in other places that you said your parents were drug dealers. So they are, yeah, they were. What what was that all about? You know, I didn't find out until I was like 16 years old that my parents were drug dealers and they did it to give me and my brother a better life. Cause like a lot of uh black you know, parents, they didn't, they didn't have the education or the family connection or even the inspo to go to school, the inspo to be a businessman, because we're, you know, my grandfather was the first in our family to own a house. Do you know what I mean? And so that's a big dream. Think about like that. When in the in the world of dreams, it's like, oh, hopefully one day I get to own a house because I'm a black man in the 70s or 60s when he bought the house. You know what I mean? It's kind of difficult. He had to get one of his friends, Mark Larry, which is a white man, to put in his name. You know, switch it over to my grandma. It was like he couldn't even get a house in that in that um neighborhood. Anyway, say all that to say this, my parents did not want me living that kind of a lifestyle. And so they took the drug dealing route. But um, at 16 years old, I knew because my face decided to stop when I got saved. And that's when my, you know, TDs were taken to the pawn shop. That's when we moved back, you know, to our old neighborhood with my grandparents. And that's when, you know, my, my mom sold everything that's about drug, drug money. And so. So it sounds was, like it was a pretty was, rocky time for you. You know, it wasn't. I didn't know. I did not know. 
I didn't, you know, my, my parents showed up to every game. They took me, I was in the studio constantly. I went to church every single Sunday. I had any and everything I wanted, but not only that, my parents just raised me with good morals and good values. And like, I don't know, they're just, they're just when I say like they should raise America, I just didn't know, I didn't know they were drug dealers. I actually have a song on my new album called Drug Dealers because it put in perspective for me, like my parents not criminal in and of itself, you know what I mean, as far as like that, but a lot of people have, you know, places that they come from that they can't help, they came from those places. And they make a lot of decision because a lot of decisions because they come from those places, and um, a lot of them being minorities, you know, like myself. And I think a lot of people even confuse are confused by me because of my urban edge, or I like fashion, or I don't talk like your normal worship leader. I don't look like your normal worship leader, and it's maybe sketchy to a lot of like I think more of my Caucasian audience. Like sometimes it can be just very sketchy the approach. Like, oh, are you a good guy? You got a wrong sauce to you you know what I mean but I think sometimes you just you don't you can't help where you come from it makes you it molds you and it shapes you and I think like my parents have gone through that and have made it on the other side which most people don't either in dead or in jail and so for my parents to not be in dead or in jail and because they were huge drug dealers and I think that was just the Lord preserving them thank God and um yeah now on the other side of that and yeah it's great but that did happen uh, my dad was also a drug user, so, you know, <laughs> oh, wow. happens everywhere, doesn't it? Um, yeah, yeah, and interestingly, that was how my whole family got saved. So it, it is incredible when um, the stories of God's grace working through what looks like on the surface to be horrible situations. Yeah, and that's crazy because, I mean, and this was, I'm so grateful to they never, they never actually did the drugs too because that would, that would have been like a whole other experience. But like... That's cool that you went through that. And I think more people should talk about that in the church because it's like drugs or something that's more of an aftermath conversation. It's like, oh, like I did sell drugs or I did use drugs, you know? It's like, would God save me? But it's like, no one wants to like maybe talk about their own personal experiences and let other kids know, like if you are in this position as well as a nine-year-old, you know, to whatever age, you know, 19, it's like you can actually make something of yourself and you're not going to go down the same path as like your parents or, or your, you know, your dad or whatever the case may be. You know, I think like just giving people hope and them understanding like come from a weird place and make something great out of it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and I, I don't know about you, but similarly, my, my dad wasn't a drug dealer, but he was a drug user. He was addicted to yeah. steroids, cocaine, you know, everything, everything fell apart eventually. But like you, for a very long time, I had no idea. My mother had no idea. We, we were quite a middle class family. You would not have known from the outside looking in. And yeah. people still say to my mum, especially, and to me, like, surely you must have known. And it's amazing as a child, what your parents do pr protect you from consciously or subconsciously and I'm glad I didn't know <laughs> yeah but you, but you have been through some tough some tough stuff and, and and perhaps again like you were saying that that is you know something that differentiates your music from from the average white middle class worship leader and um, it's not like you know I don't want to say like white you know it's like it is predominantly a white genre but it's like I think sometimes when we see something so much, it's programmed in our head to look and feel the same way. And I think sometimes when it's like looking, when it starts to look different, it could just be sometimes threatening, but also sometimes appealing, depending on your mindset and your heart, you know what I mean? And so um, I think also, yeah, the things that I faced growing up, molestation, my parents being drug dealers, also just me being this, I was always this hip urban kid I, I never thought I thought I could do something Christian music but until I was 16 I didn't really even see myself being a straight up Christian guy you know like famous for being a Christian that's scary to me still today I don't want to be famous for being a Christian Jesus Christ you know what I mean that's kind of horrifying traumatizing but um, but I never saw that you know in my future but it's cool that the Lord like literally molded me into I guess like my heart to my interior of my heart you know the inside just made me into you know one of his ultimately and and didn't feel need to make package me in a, you know in different ways like there was a in the beginning of my career I, I tried to do the white sounding voice I tried to 
sing with the rasp. They called me, the radio people, like, can you sing this without any rasp? And, you know, the first time it really scared me. Like, I got kind of like sad about it, you know? I was sad. And it really made me heartbroken a little bit. But then, you know, now being who I am, like, I, I don't redo anything. Joyful is the first take. They wanted it redone. I didn't do it. And it's it made history. And I think, like, a lot of times, if you just feel different, like, that's not going to work. And what they're saying is be, you being Black is not going to work. And so I think um, just me taking those little nuggets, whatever the case may be, and, like, not changing the exterior person, like, like how I look, you know, how I want to if I want to wear like a big t-shirt and jeans, I'm going to do that, you know, but, but at first it was like the top hats and the skinny jeans with the cut in them and the Chelsea boots. And I'm just not with, I don't wear stuff like that. So I wear my hats and all that stuff. Anyway, I still like to say this, like my makeup has everything to do with what I've gone through. And um, my parents, all that stuff they've gone through has everything to do with my music now and what you hear on my, my songs very refreshing to hear you like you're you're able and willing to speak about that honestly because that is important for people isn't it yeah you know and especially when someone's thinking about it without bitterness you know it's like yeah you chalk it up to the to the world you know it's like this is how i was born into you know so much is shallow these days pictures but not words texts that seem impersonal tweets rather than conversation it can leave us all feeling rather empty at Premier Christianity, we go deeper to bring you a thought-provoking and credible mix of theological articles, biblical interpretation, interviews, debates, and trends. Premier Christianity, online, in print, in depth. Subscribe today at premierchristianity.com. I guess what I wanted to ask you as well was that, you know, what you just touched on, you said it, it was quite scary for you in the beginning to, to think that you might be famous for being a Christian what is it about that, that that frightens you is it the expectation or the you know the whole pedestal like christian celebrity thing yeah because like what is that and then like also i have this song i'm writing right now with one of my really really good friends who writes a lot of my songs with me but um i have a song i'm writing right now called idolatry and it's you know a lot of singers sing about idolatry like there's only one god you know i won't let my career be my god or my you know, family are like, you know, there's only one, I only idolize one thing, that's Jesus, right? And it's like, I'm writing this song based on like how people idolize me. The people that say there's only one God that they love and, and they, they, there's only one that we look to as far as like any idolization, you know, it's like we idol his life, his life is like worthy of it, you know? Um, same people that do that will turn around and like idolize me and don't even know it. And that's why sometimes, you know, my grandmother speaks of a time where her pastor had a huge fall and she was miserable about it. And then she realized, oh my God, he was somewhat my God in a way mm. to where it actually changed how I felt about God because of what he did. Like literally the person that's not God changed her mind about the actual person she was supposed to be idolizing. But because it's human form and we can see it and we can feel it and we can touch it and be around it, it's like, oh, oh my God, Chandler, oh, so cool. Like, oh, Carrie Joe, oh, you know what I mean? And I think as a Christian, whatever, ambassador, I think not, I am an ambassador of the kingdom, but I think as an ambassador of the kingdom, I'm going to take the approach of like letting people know like, hey, I am not the Lord God Almighty. I am Dante Bo and I fart and I wake up in the morning and you know sometimes I'll just before I brush my teeth, I just go out. You know what I mean? Like, dude, fan of my day. Sometimes I skip like it. You know, like I, I think like I want people to know we are actually the same. Not like, you know, slips like we're the same. Oh. You know, like, no, like we are all the same. We're all the same. We're playing the same exact game. And no matter in this little game of life, you know, it's like, and we're doing it with the Lord and, and no one's worthy of a pedestal. No one. It's only one God that's alive and that can, that can heal, that can save, that can restore. There's only one. And I think people are cool to admire and be inspired by, but not to idolize and not to put on a pedestal as if they're incapable of like flaw or like 
anything of that sort. So being a fam- being famous for being a Christian is ridiculous because who's done it great? It's like, we're all like trying to live that life pleasing, you know, to him. And it's like, I don't want all, like if I'm in, like, I have bad road rage sometimes. It's like, I mean, <laughs> I just think like, it's like sometimes it's hard to tackle road rage. So like, like you, it's not something you, you find flattering more than you find humbling. So for me, I find it very humbling to be recognized for my faith. And who do you have in your life that that helps you with that, Dante? Because you know that th- there there are so many. It feels like it comes hard and fast at the moment. Like some other pro- prominent Christian slipping up. It is so devastating to the Christian community. It, it right does impact people. But, you know, I also kind of think, well, you know, does it get to a point when you are famous for being a Christian that you exist in this world that that you do become above reproach and above challenge and, you know, you don't have people speaking into your life that sort of helpfully put you in your place every now and then, you know, who who does that for you? What what do you do to make, to guard yourself from getting too caught up in that? that Everybody. I don't, I don't hang out with everybody. I literally don't have any celebrity friends. Well, I do. Sorry, y'all. (laughs) If they lose it, I do. You must have but, some. <laughs> but, but I can say this because it's true. I don't have any in my core circle. I don't have any, any. And I only hang out with the people that knew me before all this even happened. Like this morning, I posted on Instagram, love yourself. And I was like talking about my blinds were down in my room. And I like to wake up to a bright room. I don't like waking up to darkness. I hate it. But anyway, so I woke up to darkness today. I was like, well, it's been like, oh, who did this? Like, I think my, my best friend, Jesse, put all the blinds down. My point is, I was talking about it so much. I'm like, you know, maybe I should leave the windows down because I don't want the neighbors to see my bottom when I go use the restroom the first thing in the morning. And my grandmother texted me. She said, too much information. But I, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I posted on Instagram, I'm like, my grandmother, ladies and gentlemen, literally text me, bro, too much information. You know, I was like, but I have people constantly in my life that are like, that aren't well known and don't have a lot that tells me constantly like, no, you shouldn't do that. Or maybe you should do this or don't listen to that person. That's not real. You know what I mean? They're on the outside of everything. And I think that's the healthiest way I've found to operate in this world is to have people on the outside of everything. So that way they see properly, not people that are doing exactly what I'm doing. And like the same life I'm living, like as far as being a worship leader or, or artist and stuff like that. My best friends are just sitting at home being husbands to my nieces and my nephews. And they're like, dude, that's weird. I don't care what you say, you know, or that's cool. You know what I mean? So. I think we all need more people in our life like that. <laughs> I, my grandmother's a boss, okay? Like my, my dad, my dad uses this phrase that I hate. And he uses this phrase like, that's not allowed. He says that's not allowed. You know, it's like he can be anything. Like, say if I said something like that person, blah, 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 I'm just gossiping. Like, he's like that's not allowed. That's not allowed. But he's talking about in the, in the Christian world. He's like, as a Christian, that's not allowed. You know what I mean? Like, but so it's so convicting because I'm like, oh, that's a crazy way to say that because it's not. It's illegal in the kingdom of God to be a gospel. Literally illegal. Yeah. <laughs> it's like that's his way of talking about it. That's not allowed. One last story. Can I tell one last yeah, story? Yeah, yeah, go for it. My best friend Seth is right here. He also does my media and stuff like that. We're on tour together. And for some reason, we're walking out of the arena. And he's in, I'm in front of him. But I just stop for him to open the door because I'm used to it. Because I have used to have my managers and stuff with me all the time. And he's like, bro, you're getting too famous or something. No. He's like, bro, you got to open that door yourself. <laughs> I'm like, oh my bad. I'm like, I'm, like, I'm so used to right something that happened. I'm like, I'm so used to people opening the door for me. I didn't recognize that. So even like the more minute, like the small things, my, my friends are like, bro, relax. Mm-hmm. I'm not opening the door for you. You open the door yourself. You were in front of me. You open the door for me. <laughs> I love it. Everyone needs more friends like that. <laughs> you tell Seth I approve. <laughs> friends like that? Good. Brilliant. Thank you for having me. It was a lot of fun. (laughs) That was Dante Bell speaking to me, Emma Fowl, here on Premier Christian Radio. We hope you enjoyed this interview. 
For hundreds more conversations like this, you can download The Profile as a podcast. Just search for The Profile wherever you normally get your podcast from or visit premierchristianradio.com forward slash The Profile. You've been listening to The Profile in association with Premier Christianity magazine.